James Cameron once gave people permission to, quote, shoot him in the head, unquote, if he would turn in a script longer than 110 pages. He said this after he did the same experiment I will do today with the Sicario script. Stay tuned. We're almost there. I'm finishing the Sicario challenge today and we're going to draw some big conclusions. But first, let's do the work to diligently copy the final 15 pages of the script. I'll report as I go. This is where we made it uh, yesterday, page 90. This is, in my view, the beginning of Act 3. I may have been misspelling Silvio, or it's not consistent in the screenplay. I'll check that after I finish. Interesting when Delta uh, takes Reggie down, he could have done that with a racial slur, but instead there's a sexual reference here, um, which is a much better solution. It's probably also more realistic. This is a great example of Teller Sheridan not choosing sides. He poses or he puts the various options of the various arguments to us and it's up, up to us to make our uh, draw our conclusions. Sheridan says um, it's not up to me to give the answers. My job is to ask the questions. Ah, there we go. It's inconsistent. He spelled Silvio differently previously. The problem with that of inconsistency in any element of a screenplay is that when you run reports, you're going to get mistakes. If you run a character report and you misspell a character's name in the character heading, you'll have a listing for several characters while it's one and the same. Same for locations. You'll get a location listing, but if the same location is listed twice uh, with a different description, as we had with the saloon, then that will show up twice. It's a minor inconvenience, but producers will like it if, if there's some consistency. And as I showed you, it's actually faster to type if you stick to an existing description. Now I'll show you how this can be fixed really simply. Um, the correct spelling is S-I-L-V-O. So we're going to do that. Um, we're going to match case. And now we're back into Alejandro, Alejandro's point of view. And this is the third act proper. Alejandro speaks here explaining why he fired those shots. It's not for Manuel, it's for us. We need to understand what he does. We're with him. We need to be in his point of view. We don't want to have any questions about what he's thinking. It's good screenwriting. At the end, I'll give you a list of all my points. But as we continue, see which choices you agree with and which you don't. That's how you develop your style. Now, back to work. Again here, Manuel asking, what happens when we get to the house? I doubt whether a character under the circumstances would ask any question. Um, but it's for us. We want to anticipate. We want to know the plan. And by knowing the plan, we're more identified with our POV character, uh, Alejandro. This is the climactic finale. We're on page 97 here, and, um, uh, and we're in the point of view of Alejandro. So this is somewhat unexpected after we had set up Kate as the POV character in the film. And what is quite remarkable is that it works. And when you have a story like this, where it is part of the concept that you have a significant point of view shift late in the story, are you willing to break the principles and do it and stick to the story you want to tell or give it up or write the novel? Because um, it may all seem easy because the film is there and it, you know you've enjoyed it but um, this is not an easy screenplay to get financed this is different from the film because in the film the kids stay there this doesn't happen in the film either the stabbing with the fork here I would um, again correct this and have the slug lines indicate where we are so I'm going to do that now Another piece of dialogue that was not 
necessary and I don't think it made the film. Just looking at it tells the story. This happens in the film, but it's happening later when she at first refuses to sign. This monologue is replaced with an opening card that explains where the word comes from. Image of the Wolf comes back in the other, in the third part of the trilogy. Tala Sheridan's Wind River opens with a um, scene with wolves. Very different ending to the scene in the film. That ending in the film reminds me of another ending of a film, uh, I, I think around the same time, a, a few years back at least, um, Eye in the Sky. Never tell a soldier that he does not know the cost of war. This is the power of audio. There are no visuals backing that up, so it's purely the audio that delivers this. And Audio plays a really important role. Now read those final words again. How does Alejandro's final voiceover frame the question? Or does it give us an answer? Or does it suggest an answer to the question? Or what question is being asked? What do you think this means? Write it in the notes in the comments to this video below. Um, I'm keen to see your, um, your ideas. I mentioned that these last 15 pages were also the final act of the script. How so? Because they cover the final action of the film. Alejandro went on his way to bring down the killer of his family, and then he did that. On page 91, the Delta could have used a racial slur in line with Reggie's earlier mention of race, but the sexual reference here works better. It's not about sanitizing or keeping things PC, but about staying focused. In the climactic third act, Alejandro explains why he shoots Manuel in the leg and then the hand. Later, he explains what will happen at the house. Neither lines are realistic, but they do something important. They draw in the audience. Without the first explanation, we would have been left wondering, possibly even distracted. The second line builds anticipation, which is essential for viewer participation. People have speculated about Taylor Sheridan's political views as his characters come from all sides. However, Alejandro's monologue about the return to order says that if people keep doing drugs and don't want a Juarez on their doorstep, this is what the government needs to do. Kate has trouble buying this. Now, if you accept Kate as your hero in the final act, she's not fighting this binary option. In other words, Alejandro and Kate establish the moral order of the script and by association that of the writer. The film ends on Eliseo, who is an indirect victim. He only has three scenes in the script spread over four pages, plus that one brief moment on page 100. Not much, but enough for a powerful subplot. And I wonder if there was ever a draft of the script or a cut of the movie where we open on Eliseo. In the script, Alejandro visits Kate to give her advice. We need that final meeting to give their screen relationship closure. But there is no real transaction. It doesn't affect the plot or the outcome of the story. Every great scene should be in some way a transaction. Now look at the theatrical version. It's literally a transaction. Kate has to sign an agreement. This powers the scene, Kate's arc, and the entire movie. Kate is now accepting her role in the operation. And remember what we said about theme. All through the film, she's been courageous enough to put her life at risk in the pursuit of justice. If she believed in it strongly, she would have sacrificed her life to keep things by the book and let the villains off the hook. But she doesn't. So when she signs the agreement, she doesn't do it to save her own life. She does it because she's learned that her old view of justice achieves very little. She's entered a new world, and by signing, she accepts this new reality. Quite something. Sicario grossed $85 million worldwide against a budget of $30 million. That means profit. Not much, but enough to give Sheridan's career and that of Villeneuve a boost. Despite the outstanding script, it was far from a guaranteed success. Why? Because 
The one thing that sets Sicario apart from most successful films I know is its radical shift in point of view from the end of Act 2. For about 90 minutes we invest in the character of Kate and then we shift to Alejandro for the climactic action. This move would have been a certain death for about every other movie. For Sicario it was a question of taking the risk or not telling the story at all. In this story Kate's inaction is essential to the whole point, even if she's the central POV character. But the added lines at the end bring us back to Kate and I believe they nailed the film's success. It was always going to be a gamble though, but looking at Taylor Sheridan's career, the man knows how to gamble. The key? To make sure you fully understand the game. And if anything, he does. Here on this channel I do what I can to study the game and share my findings with you. I have enjoyed this series so much I'm tempted to do it again. What script would you like me to copy next? Write it in the comments, but keep in mind you have to be willing to join me in the work. If you want to try this method today on more genres, check out Immersion. The links are in the notes below as well as a 50% discount voucher. By the way, there's something for the Sicario fans there too. If this video sparked your interest, subscribe and hit the bell for updates. For now, thanks for tuning in, happy watching and happy writing. Cheers.